chapter 6. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, the daughters were born to them, and then the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. Now note this, Bible students. Sons of God. The sons of God saw the daughters of men. Benai Elohim is sons of God. In the Old Testament, without exception, when Benai Elohim, sons of God, is used, it always speaks of, without exception, angels. Whether they be good angels or fallen angels. Angels in heaven or fallen angels, demons in hell. So what's happening here in chapter 6? It's very interesting. Sons of God, in this case, fallen angels, saw the daughters of men and took them. And it would seem as though this was encouraged by or allowed by the daughters of men. Relations with these demonic entities sexually, in perversity. The state of the world had got that bad, where people were looking for pleasure. So pornographically that they would look to anything and to anyone to further their erotic pleasure. Not far from where we are today, I might say. And darkness is being called in, sad to say, into our culture because of an obsession with eroticism. But that's what's happening here in the days before the flood. These demons are interacting with those women, and God said, that's it. My spirit, verse 3, shall not always strive with man. His days shall be 120 years his time is up. I'm giving him 120 years to get right or to be taken out. My spirit shall not always strive with man. Genesis 6 verse 3 is an important verse. God's spirit will not continue to call, to plead, to beg a man to get right with him. There comes a time, we know not when, a line we know not where. Where when that line is crossed by man, all that's left is damnation and despair. That is, you can only say no so many times to the Spirit of God, and finally the Spirit of God will say, I won't always strive with you, Johnny, or Bill, or Lisa, or Andy, or whoever you might be. If a person says no, 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 God will say, okay, have it your way. My Spirit will not always strive with man. I'll give him 120 more years. But that's it. There were giants, verse 4 says, in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in, these fallen angels, these demons, into the daughters of men sexually, they bore children to them, and these same became the mighty men which were of old, men of renown or famous. Every culture has stories of giants, titans, Super creatures that had powers and abilities and stature and size. And those myths have roots in this story. They have roots in truth. There were giants. Nephilim is the Hebrew word. Fallen ones. What was God's, pardon me, what was the devil's plan to get these women to be seduced by those demons to produce these Fallen ones, these Nephilim, these, these giants, these men of renown. Evidently, it would seem to many, myself, I do agree with this, it was Satan's attempt to pollute and corrupt the bloodline of humanity so badly, women's blood particularly, that there could be no virgin birth, no seed of woman, no coming of a redeemer, a savior. That... It would have been so corrupted and so polluted and so demonized and defiled that Satan evidently thought, this way I will prevent this one that's supposed to come, the seed of a woman, to crush my head. Be that as it may. These giants were produced, Nephilim giants. And God saw the wickedness, verse 5, of man was great in the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Images, 
Boy, does that speak to this world today, our culture today. Images on screens, on computers, images in minds, nothing but evil and darkness for far too many, far too many. And it repented, verse 6, the Lord, that he had made man on the earth. It grieved him in his heart. God repents. It doesn't mean God says, oh, I made a mistake. It means I'm going to change my plan, my direction, my way. I realize something must be done, God would say. I will destroy, verse 7, man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing, fowls of the air too, for it repents me that I have made them. Man fouled up, creeped out, was beastly on the earth to such a degree the whole creation was polluted and affected. But... I like that. Verse 8. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. There was a man. Everybody else was looking on others sexually, pervertedly, lustfully. But Noah lifted up his eyes to the face of God. And he found in the eyes of the Lord grace. Anyone who looks on the Lord, looks to the Lord, looks at the Lord, will find in the eyes of the Lord is grace. 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 Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah, verse 9. Noah was a just man, perfect mature in his generation. Noah walked with God. Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth was corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence. God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. All flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God, verse 13, said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come up before me. The earth is filled with violence. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So, verse 14, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Gopher wood in Bible days was used for primarily the making of caskets. And the ark will be a great big casket in dimension, in appearance. Why? Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. You got to die. You got to deny yourself. And you'll be lifted up and you'll be saved. So build this big casket, this big box. The ark wasn't a ship like a battleship or a destroyer or cruise boat. It was a great big box, great big barge made of gopher wood. Rooms, verse 14 says, thou shalt make in the ark. The word rooms there, by the way, in the Hebrew is nests. Speaks of for your young'uns, for your children. Interesting. Noah makes rooms, nests for his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and for their wives. Listen, we'll do the math later on, not tonight, but the math. He did this, built this ark, started construction of the ark with its nests for his kids and their wives to be on board 20 years before his first son was born. By faith, Hebrews says, by faith, Hebrews 11, by faith, Noah built an ark for the saving of his house. Before his kids were even born, he said, man, at the end of the day, my kids are going to be on board the good ship salvation. They're going to be safely tucked away in their nests, on board by faith. That ought to be the heart of every parent in here. By faith, my, my kids might wander off for a while. They might go astray, hey. But I believe that God put them in my family to be on board this ark that at the end of the day, they'll be on board by faith. You take the hammer of God's word, the nails that he absorbed, and you pound away in faith, day by day by day, saying, my kids are going to do well. They're going to be on board. Don't let your kids think that you're doubting their salvation despairing of their condition, they'll live down to that. Let them hear in you, Dad. Let them see in you, Mom, that you have faith 
that God put them in your house because he ordained them to be a part of his family. And Noah built nests for his kids, for their wives, 20 years before his first kid was born. He builds this ark, and it says, he pitched it within and without with pitch. The word there is kofar, used 70 times in the Old Testament. Only here is it translated pitch. Every other place it's used as atonement or covering. I like this. Build a casket. You got to die with me to live beside me, and you will. Make room for your kids. They'll be on board too. And it's about, here, here's the pitch. <laughs> atonement, covering, you see. And this is the fashion which you shall make it of, verse 15. The length shall be 300 cubits, which is 450 feet, by 50 cubits, which is 75 feet, by the height of 30 cubits, which is 45 feet. 97,000 square feet, 520 boxcars behind a locomotive in size. They say that there's 18,000 species of animals. Let's say many have gone extinct. Well, they say that if you took twice that many, 36,000 species of animals, you could fit them easily on 120 or in 120 boxcars. That is, if they weren't fighting, if they were at rest, if they were anesthetized, plenty of room. The ark itself was so massive, it was equal to 520 boxcars. Plenty of room for all the animals. Plenty of room for even food for them and family members too. What about dinosaurs? Plenty of room for baby dinosaurs. <laughs> Little guys. Be that as it may. The numbers here, no one can dispute the numbers if they calculate carefully that there'd be plenty of room for all of the species of animals on the face of the earth today. So this ark was large. And a window thou shalt, verse 16, make to the ark. And in a cubit thou shalt finish it above. And the door thou shalt set in the side of it, both on the lower, second, and third stories you shall make it. The door was three stories, the ark was three stories, and the door went through all three stories. God would close the door. Man had no control of the door, but he could control the window. The door speaks of salvation. Jesus said, I am the door. And men, we are locked in. And he saved us and brought us aboard and sealed us and closed the door. But the window, which speaks not of salvation, but illumination, you control. What do you mean? How much light you have, it's up to you. How much do you want to be open to the word of God and spend time in the word of God and learn about God? The window is under your control. The door, not so. So there's a window at the top. There's a door down the sides. And the ark was three stories high. Behold, verse 17, God says, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. And everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee, Noah, verse 18, will I establish my covenant. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou, thy sons, and thy wife, and thy sons' wives too. And every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, and cattle after their kind, of creeping things after his kind. Two of every sort shall come unto thee. Noah didn't go round up the animals. The animals were brought to him. They shall come to thee, and you're to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it unto thee, and it shall be food for thee and also food for them. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. And the Lord said to Noah, Come thou, and all thy house to the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take unto thee by sevens, male and female, and of the beasts that are not clean, two, male and female. Why were clean beasts coming by sevens? Because they would be sacrificed. Unclean beasts wouldn't. 
So he had to have spare of the clean beast, you see. Also fowls of the air by sevens, male and female, to keep the seed alive upon the face of the earth. Lots of birds are needed to scatter the seeds after the flood was through. And you know how birds do that, don't you? For yet seven days, verse 4 tells you and me, will I cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. He was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. He was 500 years old when he had Ham, Shem, and Japheth, verse 32 of chapter 5. But God said, the flood's going to come 120 years after this, verse 3 of chapter 6. That's the math. You see, so he had to start the ark when he was 480, 120 years. The flood came when he was 600. But his kids didn't come till he was what age? Come on, people in the land of Nod, let's go. Right. So there you have the math for you that are interested in such things. Well, verse 7, Noah went in, his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives with him into that ark because of the waters of the flood, of clean beasts and beasts that were not clean, of fowls and of everything that creeps upon the earth. There went in two and two, or two by two, unto Noah into that ark, male and female, just as God commanded Noah. And it came to pass, verse 10, after seven days, the waters of the flood were upon the earth. And in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and rain came upon the earth. That is, fountains from underneath, subterraneanly, were broken, bursting up. The water canopy above came crashing down. The world was deluged with water for 40 days and 40 nights. The self-same day, verse 13, entered Noah, Shem, and Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons into that ark. And they, verse 14, and every beast after his kind, all the cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth after his kind, every fowl after his kind, every bird of every sort, they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they went in went in male and female of all flesh as God commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. You're locked in. You're sealed. You're on board and you ain't getting out, God would say. And not only that, but hey, 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 Noah, you're probably going to want to open the door when you hear the screams and cries of people outside. I know that. That will be your heart and tendency. But my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. I see what you don't see. I know what you'll never know. I'm shutting the door. You can't open it up to include others that didn't believe, that didn't heed, that didn't receive. It's sealed. You're going to be sealed in, but they're going to be sealed out. I am the door, Jesus said. No man comes to the Father but by me. He that hath the Son hath life, but he that hath not the Son, what gang, shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. Hath God said, Satan will hiss in your ear. That sounds cruel. That sounds mean. That sounds like God isn't very good to me. No. It's just that you're an idiot. I'm dumb. We don't see what God sees. We can't understand what he knows. But God is good. He proved it when he died for all of humanity shed his blood, laid down his life, gave every person opportunity to be saved from himself and his sin and Satan and damnation. God shut the door, locking Noah in and keeping Noah from trying to open up the door to include others that couldn't and shouldn't 
and wouldn't come in. Well, he shut the door. Where are we? I lost my place here. Thank you. Verse 16, the Lord shut him in, and the flood was 40 days upon the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it was lifted above the earth. The waters prevailed, were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. All the high hills were under the water. They were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. This was not a local flood as some people try and say it was. The mountains were covered. The water spilled over the highest of mountains. It was everywhere. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both fowl and cattle, beast and creeping thing, and every man. All, verse 22, in whose nostrils was the breath of life, and all that was in the dry land, they died. And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and creeping things and fowl. They were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed upon the earth a hundred and fifty days.